Okay, well, I'm Tim Madigan uh, from the St. John Fisher Irish Studies Program, and I'm delighted to be talking with James Doherty, a military historian in Waterford, uh, Ireland, and we're here at the Granville Hotel, and I wonder if you could first say the significance of this site. Yeah, a very historic building, Tim. Uh, Granville Hotel was the birthplace of Brigadier General Thomas Francis Mar. Mar was born here in 1823, lived a very kind of uh, illustrious, kind of quite flamboyant, international life. I'm sure we'll talk more about that a bit later, but this is his birthplace. So there's a lot of items here relating to the history of the Mar, uh, the man himself and his family. And of course he uh, was involved with the uh, Fighting Irish Brigade. Yeah, so Mar kind of had, a, like I said, a very uh, interesting life. Um, in Ireland he'd be very well known for his role and he founded or created the idea of the Irish tricolour flag. He flew that first in 1848. Uh, unfortunately, the problem with that for Mar was uh, during 1848, Ireland was still part of the British Empire, so the uh, creation, the flying of an Irish uh, flag was actually a seditious act. So Mar was tried, arrested and tried, and sentenced, to sed uh, sentenced for sedition. Originally, he was actually sentenced to be hung, drawn and quartered. Right? Yeah. So luckily enough for Mar, that didn't happen. And the very young uh, Queen Victoria showed kind of her mettle quite young and actually instructed the Mar to be pardoned. Uh, she was very aware of the fact that Mar's death would create a martyr mm -hmm. of Mar to the Irish people. So Mar was sentenced to uh, deportation to Tasmania. I would imagine the Queen thought that was the problem solved. But Mar promptly escaped from Tasmania after a slight <laughs> delay. Uh, with interest, his family interest in the shipping industry, uh, they managed to arrange his escape from Tasmania. Travelled from Tasmania via South America, took the long way around, uh, ended up in New York. In New York, he was instrumental really in encouraging Irish men in the North to enlist and fight on the Union side. Mm -hmm. And in 1963, when President John F. Kennedy visited Ireland, he directly credited Mar's role in, 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 the, in the 1860s as influencing the Irish to, to fight for the cause of the Union. And in Kennedy's opinion, that willingness of the Irish to fight um, showed, I suppose, their loyalty to their new found home. So Mar originally was a captain, uh, he quite quickly got promoted and he ended up in charge of the Irish Brigade and he's with the Irish at uh, battles such as you know, Bull Run, the Wilderness, but most famously uh, Gettysburg and Fredericksburg. And then Mar, after the war, was acting governor of, of uh, Montana and disappeared in 1867, so 150 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so disappeared in 1867 in mysterious circumstances. Yeah, uh, do you recall how old he was at the time of his death? Um, he, he, was, he was a very young man um, when he uh, unveiled the flag here. And married when he died, he would have been 45. So It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just how much uh, living he packed in a short amount of time. Yeah, he certainly did. On yeah. three, four continents, yeah, actually. I guess yeah, he went to yeah. South America for yeah. a while. He was involved in a scheme, a kind of a, a filibuster almost scheme in uh, Panama. Uh, briefly and then back to uh, New York so yeah he kind of got he managed to get himself in trouble on four different continents. <laughs> that's very Irish yeah, I guess. yeah very much so now the other thing that fascinates me about the young Ireland movement that he was involved with uh, is his relationship with John Mitchell mm. who ended up also escaping and coming yeah, to, uh, to America yeah, yeah. Uh, Mara and Mitchell had been firm friends and they only really kind of split uh, on the issue of slavery. Mm -hmm. Mitchell, uh, both his sons uh, fought in the Confederate Army. He lost one son in the Confederate Army. And uh, Mar, obviously, as we just mentioned, fought on the Union side. So yeah, they, they, they had very similar views when it came to Irish politics, but very different divergent views on American uh, politics, with Mitchell taking the Confederate side. I actually had the pleasure last year of getting a tour of the Doyle by Eamon O'Quee, yeah, uh, Eamon yeah, de Valera's yeah, grandson, yeah. whose great-grandmother is buried in Rochester, yeah. where, I, where I live. And part of the tour, uh, there was a curtain that was uh, opened up, and it was the flag, yeah. the battle flag of the Fighting 69 that John Kennedy had brought here. Exactly, and it, yeah, it hangs with great pride of place in, in Leinster House, um, or Dáil, as you said. And it's, it's a key kind of feature for people when they visit Ireland or Dublin, they like to see the flag. Uh, every year we get representatives over from 69th, and they're always quite keen to go visit the yeah. flag. 
it, it's it's uh, John F. Kennedy's speech to the House. It's, it's still on, it's on on a line on YouTube. I'd recommend anyone to watch it. A very talented, very skilled public author. It was a very important day in Irish history. Um, he uh, said some very wise, very kind of a uh, very uh, humor hum humorous words about Irish politics when he was here. So. Well, I was in New Ross earlier today, which of course was the birthplace of his uh, great grandfather. Mm. So the Kennedy connections are strong in this area. Yeah, too. It's, it's amazing, really. Um, we're here in Waterford, looking out over the quay here in Waterford, and Thomas Francis Marr, born here in the Granville, another very important, influential figure in the early uh, American military was Commodore John Barry. Oh, yeah. He's often regarded as the founder of the American Navy, and he was born. A stone's throw from here on the other side of the river in County Wexford. So a lot of key features, a lot of key people I should say. I saw the statue yeah, there. John Unfortunately Barry, the yeah. pub John Barry wasn't open. So. Oh, okay. yeah. nice <laughs> I would pub. like to have toasted yeah. his honour. We'll, we'll arrange that the next time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. It's a good excuse to go down. Yeah. <laughs> now the, uh, I was here yesterday for another event honouring Patrick Clooney. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could say a little bit about yeah, him. Yeah, sure. Um, so yesterday is part of um, the Tricolor mm -hmm. celebration. We, we I suppose we memorise and we um, celebrate the first flying of the Irish flag here every year. And I'm involved in organising that. Uh, yesterday we had a small ceremony, a replay ceremony, a ceremony of remembrance for Captain Patrick Clooney. Now Clooney isn't actually uh, buried uh, here in Waterford. He died on the field in Antietam, so yeah. buried in New York. Um, but when the news of Clooney's death came back to his hometown of Waterford, they raised by public subscription, uh, people donated, they raised by public subscription, and they erected a fantastic memorial to Clooney. Now it is, at the moment, in need of restoration work, and we're kind of looking into that, and we're kind of talking to the right people. So that's hopefully something like... Well, that's something, you know, we were talking earlier about trying to get more Americans interested in the Civil War in general, but particularly Irish-American, to... Uh, know more about the work that you and others are doing to kind of uh, bring back the stories of these people yeah, who came yeah, to America. because they're, they're fascinating stories and um, Clooney in particular um, was a real adventurer mm -hmm. and, uh, and he, he was a very good self-publicist. Wherever he went he used to write back to the papers in Waterford telling how he was getting on so he was very aware of his, I suppose, his image. Uh, but Clooney had fought in the Papal Wars. Now the Papal Wars uh, Pope Pius the Ninth. This is the time of uh, Garibaldi's reorganization of Italy. So Pope Pius the Ninth was scared of losing the sovereignty of the Vatican and raised a Catholic volunteer army. Now, um, over a thousand Irishmen travelled out, um, and very, I suppose, even the act of going to Italy was a brave act, because under the laws at that time, it was illegal for Irishmen to join foreign armies. They could join the British army, but not foreign armies. So these thousand Irish volunteers were actually breaking the law, but but they even go to Italy and fight, and they actually all declared themselves as tourists when they went. <laughs> yeah. So to get around that, they pretended they were tourists in mass went out to Italy, and Clooney, uh, Clooney was involved in some very heavy fighting in Italy. Uh, now the Papal War was quite short. The, the Irish, the Brigade or the International Brigade didn't work out very well. They had problems with language, uniforms, equipment. So you guys from all over basically. The only real unit that distinguished himself were the Irish uh, in, the, in the fighting. So Clooney came back to Ireland briefly. He had heard, and obviously he knew of the fighting in, in, in America, travelled to America and he was kind of rapidly promoted because he had previous sure, yeah. military um, service. So originally he was a sergeant in the uh, 69th and ended up uh, with the 88th in, um, and uh, died on the field of Antietam. As he was regarded and at the time, and some of his men often called him the bravest of the brave. True. So he's a big loss to the unit. Was very, very one of the most important battles of the war. Yeah, yeah, a, fan, um, a fantastically, um, uh, I suppose, gruesome affair. I mean, a real clash of two uh, military juggernauts. But Jay yeah, Clooney died there at Antietam carrying the Irish Brigade flag at the time. So Clooney has said his memorial is here. When they raised the public subscription, they printed the names in the paper of all those who subscribed. They also actually printed the names of some people who didn't subscribe that they had contacted. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a novel way of raising money. Yeah, actually, I'm sure a lot of fundraisers today would yeah, like to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, shame into it. So, no, Clooney's one of those guys who definitely falls into the character, uh, like the, the character of uh, an adventurer. I think this was a man yeah. who wanted to be in the thick of it, and I don't think he was 
happy with the kind of maybe sedentary kind of boring life that he may have lived if he'd have stayed here in Warford. Mm -hmm. so that wasn't the life of Captain Patrick Clooney. No, I mean that that's uh, I had not heard of him previously, mm. and uh, as we were saying, I, I think so many of these people they, they their stories deserve to be heard. Well, they do, and they were they were very brave men and women fighting in very interesting times, with a very international uh, flavour to it, and it is good. I think the more we learn about warfare and military history, one would hope that you kind of try and avoid some of the mistakes of the past, or the past, I should say. Doesn't always work out like that. Yeah. But you know, the more you learn, I think, uh, the more you know, it, the better armed you are. Well, you know, related to that, I'm from Buffalo, and uh, it, last year we commemorated the 150th anniversary of the Fenian raid, yeah. or the Fenian invasion, as it's yeah. called in Canada, uh, and the Civil War connection there. Yeah. And uh, that's another aspect of. The Irish in the American Civil War yeah. that is very little known, and particularly the the depth of it. Yeah, the, the whole aspect of the Fenian involvement in the American Civil War and the Irish Republican Brotherhood, um, uh, their involvement in Irish politics after the war um, is fascinating, and like not many people know that between 1866 and 1867. Nearly a thousand uh, Fenians were arrested traveling to Ireland from the States. Mm -hmm. okay? These were men that were armed and they were sent here to help organize units of our local Irish to fight against British in the planned Rising of 1867. The Rising of 1867 kind of fizzled out. Uh, they had been heavily infiltrated by the police, we were well aware of their movements, so it didn't amount to uh, as much as it should have done, maybe. But over nearly a thousand Fenians were arrested during that time period coming into Ireland. and. One of the main reasons they got caught, or how they often were caught, is they stood out. So these were Irish men that had moved to the States, had maybe been in America 10 years, 5 years, more, whatever. So they had, you know, they changed their accent, they changed the way they are dressed. And they also had the unfortunate habit of often wearing square-toed boots, okay? These were standard military issue in America, all available in Europe. So what happened was when these guys got off the boat <laughs> in Dublin or Shannon or Cork, the British military intelligence could pick out the Fenians and there was many letters in existence of guys in Ireland writing back and saying, hey, tell the guys stop wearing yeah, square toe boots. Their boots gave them away. The boots, yeah. <laughs> and a propensity for carrying pistols was not another well-recognised one. So the Fenians were coming over here, like I said, um, trying, to, uh, trying to ignite a rebellion. And um, 150 years ago, on the 1st of June um, this year, there was called the Aaron's Hope Voyage. Now, the Aaron's Hope was a brig, it originally been called the Jack Bell. It was bought by the Fenian movement in New York. The Fenians put 20 men uh, on the boat, but also, we think, up to 10,000 uh, rifles and six light cannon. Now, the Aaron's Hope sailed from America. Uh, as I said, it was the Jack Bell when it left. Halfway during the voyage, they had a little ceremony, they, they hoisted the Fenian sunburst flag, mm -hmm. and they rechristened the, the boat, the Aaron's Hope saved Ireland and made landfall up on the west coast. The rendezvous that they had planned didn't materialise and the captain actually landed here in Watford. He moved down the coast. Now the, the members of that voyage were arrested. Uh, the Aaron's Hope fled back to uh, Britain, but they received a hero as welcome. Uh, one man uh, referred to the little brave Aaron's Hope tagging the tail of the line, which is the British Navy. So they managed to avoid the whole British Navy, got back to the States, and the, the Fenians were, were arrested. Uh, most of them were released quite quickly, but some of the leaders of that expedition, uh, ex uh, expedition I should say, were released later. And um, these again were very aware. And what they're trying to do really was provoke an international incident. Okay? Yeah. So they were writing back to the States saying, oh, we're American citizens, we're being arrested here in Ireland, you know, they didn't find any weapons because the evidence is long. Oh, yeah, we have those weapons. Yeah, <laughs> back in New York. So what they were trying to do there was engineer a rift between Britain and America. Yeah. And the Fenians, and I'll, I'll come back to the raids in a second, but mm -hmm. the Fenians, they were kind of, they're interfering with global politics. You know? They're trying to engender, they're trying to create a rift between Britain and the uh, United States. And there was very tense relations between Britain 
and the Union during the Civil yeah. War. Well, that's and right. They were trying to provoke this kind of rift, hoping... A lot of the British were pro-Confederate. Yeah, and, and, and there was kind of some diplomatic incidents, the Trent Affair, where they had the, the, the agents had been arrested uh, on a British ship, and uh, the Union had boarded the ship. So this didn't, agents. Yeah, this didn't go down well with the British. So they're very, you know, they came quite close in many ways mm -hmm. to either bringing uh, the British into the American Civil War or later helping the Irish um, uh, rise in rebellion in 1867. The raids into Canada were another example of um, trying to provoke or trying to increase international global tensions. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the raids, um, Captain Patrick Murphy. Yeah, well, because you wrote, I had not heard of mm -hmm. him before, and you wrote a wonderful article about him. Uh, which both in the Civil War and the Fenian race. Yes, yeah. so uh, Murphy, born here in Waterford, um, uh, baptized and christened in St. Patrick's Church, which is literally just around the corner yeah. from here. Um, and Murphy, as I said, the kind of your typical Irish uh, fall into categories, uh, some more adventurous. Murphy ended up fighting the American Civil War. It was, it was his job, okay? Uh, Murphy, Port City, uh, you know, uh, obviously enough, a lot of guys fall into working in the mercantile trade. Murphy was working on a ship, he started to join the British Navy, okay, mm -hmm. and he ended up finding himself working in the Great Lakes in America, mm -hmm. uh, eventually, through kind of circuitous route. Now, while Murphy was there in the Great Lakes, they were building the USS Michigan, right, to patrol and the, the, the lakes, and Murphy got a job in the construction of the ship, and when the ship was launched, Murphy was recruited as a crew. Now, in naval parlance, that's called a plank owner. Plank owner is a guy who was with the ship from the first day, and uh, historically, uh, if that ship was ever decommissioned, he could apply to get a piece of the planking as a memento, as a souvenir. So it's kind of bragging rights. Sure. So Murphy uh, was received his Medal of Honor um, for actions in Mobile Bay. Uh, so it, he, he displayed great courage under fire, mm -hmm. and his Medal of Honor citation is available quite freely online. It's, it's, it's very it's worth to re uh, read, and then. I remember first when I was researching Murphy, I was saying, oh, that's great, you know, local guy, don't go. Congressional good. Medal of Honor. Yeah, you know, so it was, a, it was a great boost to my morale when reading this. And then, but unfortunately for Murphy, his career had a little bump, uh, shall we say, later on. Uh, so in 1866, Fenians are crossing into Canada, so I won't go too much detail into raids. Mm -hmm. But like I said, what the Fenians were trying to do was provoke problems between Britain, Britain sure. and the United States. Because we often forget uh, that America and Great Britain were not very, they certainly were not no. close allies. Yeah. There were a lot of animosity yeah. still yeah. Yeah. in the two previous wars. Yeah, uh, exactly, you know, and it wouldn't have taken an awful lot to pull the British back into a war in America, which is exactly what the Fenians yeah. wanted. Okay? And of course, a lot of Americans wanted to take over the Canadian territory. Exactly. So um, we next see, like I said, Murphy uh, popping up in 1866. Now, the Fenians, when they crossed into Canada, had a major problem. The problem was the USS Michigan, okay? How can we get across the Great Lakes in these small boats with this behemoth of a Union warship sitting in the Great Lake? So they came up with a kind of an ingenious and quite simple plan uh, to get around this. Murphy was the ship's pilot. Okay? The ship wouldn't put out into the lakes without Murphy being at the helm. So the night before the raid, one of the Fenians brought Murphy to the pub, okay? and he was blind, insensible, drunk the next morning when the raid had started. So because Murphy was incapacitated, the ship couldn't leave for a period of eight hours. So all these Fenians are madly rowing across the Great Lakes under the gaze of a very upset captain of the USS Michigan. But um, Murphy uh, was actually awarded then, uh, the, he actually had got his medal in honor in 1870. Now he had far actions much earlier, so I don't think his career suffered too much. <laughs> well, I've always wondered, I mean, sort of a conspiracy theory, maybe he really wasn't drunk, I mean, it was a way... <laughs> Mate, yeah, like, I, it's hard to know, like, it's, it's a bit coincidental, all right, so I don't know, I think yeah, maybe I mean, how willing a participant... Since you're dealing with yeah. secretive yeah. groups to begin with, yeah. it's, it fits the stereotype, but it may well it have been that it, uh, been it was his way, way of, of keeping his career, very, uh, and turning very, a blind eye, as it were. I think, uh, I, I do remember reading that his wife was quite upset about the adventure, <laughs> right? So I think maybe Mrs. Murphy and Mr. Murphy are probably the only people who really know exactly 
how willing an accomplice Murphy was. Well, no matter what, it is a, a colorful uh, connection yeah. here again with Waterford yeah. and the American Civil War and the Fenian yeah. raids. Now, w the other uh, topic we were talking about is trying to encourage more Americans to come to Ireland, Americans of an interest in uh, our Civil War. Sure. Well. It's, I, I think it, there's a huge opportunity there, and I'd love to see an American-based uh, company, uh, a tour company, take up on this. Um, a small group of us over here have compiled, it's available online, I'll put up the web address, a list of over 100 uh, sites in Ireland that directly relate to the American Civil War. Now these range, so you have birthplaces of generals, we're sitting in one of them now, yeah. Thomas Francis Marr, probably one of the most able um, battlefield commanders in the Civil War, was uh, a major general Patrick Cleburne who fought for Confederacy was born here in Cork so his the house mm -hmm. he's born and still stands mm -hmm. so but you also have more um, I suppose quirky connections like just up the river from us Malcolmson Cotton Mill okay the Malcolmsons were a local wealthy family they were using 40 tons of raw cotton a week and uh, when the American Civil War started they lost access to the cotton market so they became blockade runners so you have Waterford based a family that have are buying blockade running ships in England to help supply the Confederacy. So there's loads of connections like that. The Tate factory, I think, in Limerick is probably one of the most interesting ones. Uh, Mr. Tate made several hundred thousand uniforms for the Confederate Army and were blockade ran into the south. These were all made here in Ireland. So I think there's much more of an international flair at the American Civil War than a lot of people realise. And a lot of the tangible uh, sites that still stand or still uh, near here, people can come along and visit. If you yeah. just take Warford, when in a small walk you have the Clooney Memorial, you have a statue mm. of Thomas Francis Marr, you have a lot of items related to Marr's life here in our local Warford Museum of Treasures, you, know, you have the hotel, that's all just, that's just in one city, all within sure. walking distance of each other. Well I had the pleasure of uh, visiting Cavan where Colonel Patrick O'Rourke was born, of course he moved to Rochester as a yeah, child and hotel. fought and died yeah. at Gettysburg yeah. and there's a mm. memorial to him there yeah. and uh, three years ago I had the pleasure of being in Cavan when there was a memorial to him yeah. placed at his birthplace yeah. and we also uh, went to the uh, birthplace of uh, Philip Sheridan yeah. so I, I agree with you uh, anyone interested in the American Civil War uh, would find it fascinating to come here. It's yeah. always nice to come to Ireland anyway. And there's over 140 Irish-born recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's amazing. So it's a huge, huge statistic. And every time you look at that list, uh, you find more. That list is growing. Because mm -hmm. what, you find, what you find is that the ancestries of some of the recipients have more and more Irish connections. So I think there's a huge, tangible... And for people who have an interest in the American Civil War, you know, what better uh, way to spend a holiday or vacation yeah. than visit the birthplaces of famous US generals and find a little bit more about them? Because when you come to places like Warford, you find you often find what motivated these guys. You know? sure. Marr would fall into the category of a political idealist, and it's events in his later life that then they ended up seeing Marr in the States. So you're kind of adding another dimension to your knowledge uh, knowledge base. You're adding the motivation. Like, why are these guys in, in America? Why are mm. they fighting in the American Civil War? Often the answer to that question is back here in Ireland. Well, uh, I thought maybe in conclusion, uh, talking about motivation, what motivated you to yeah, <laughs> explore this topic? Yeah, um, I suppose uh, I love military history, but I, I, I think um, it, it is the motivation, was the motivation, if you know what I mean, in that when I looked at the American Civil War, over 200,000 Irish had fought in the Civil War. Okay, so why, why were they there? And that's what really gets me. Um, um, you know, like I said, some fall into the category of political idealists, like Marr. There's another fascinating warfare figure, a guy called uh, uh, Lawrence Reynolds, who's a surgeon in the Irish Brigade. But Reynolds was involved in the Chartist Labour movement in England, had to leave England in a hurry in '48. He was involved in the Young Irelanders here in Ireland in '48. He was a Fenian, and he was a major Fenian recruiter all the way through the American Civil War. So Reynolds is another guy who was very politically astute and was interested in global politics. So there's a hardcore political idealist. A lot of the Irish guys fought for economic reasons. It was, it was one of the few employment options open, uh, military service to Irish Catholics. A lot of them uh, fought for their newly adopted states. Some were adventurous. Some of the most char colorful char characters were guys who seemed to be attracted to the, the din and the clash of spears, uh, as the saying goes. 
and people like Miles Keogh, who's just uh, from Lachlan Bridge, uh, just up the road from us. Miles died at the Battle of Little Bighorn, but had fought in the Italian Civil War, the Paper War, the American Civil War, and died at the Battle, Battle of Little Bighorn. So a kind of, I won't say a war junkie, but an, adre is, an adrenaline junkie. There's a war, I want to be in it. <laughs> yeah. I think Miles Keogh today was alive, he'd probably be like a paraglider or something like that. Yeah. He was an adrenaline guy, you know? So he, he wasn't set up for the sedate life. So that's really, I suppose, what motivates me and that's what got me interested in this topic. Well, I really appreciate all you're doing and I, I thank you for uh, allowing me to interview you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs>